Uh, my name is Hunter Andrews. I'm a relatively new staff member here at the lab. And before that, I was a postdoc working on this same project. So I'm very excited to be able to uh, talk about our recent developments in making a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy sensor for molten salt uh, reactor off-gas systems. The goal is to build these sensor systems that can go in line with our off-gas treatment system and help make that jump from bench scale, bench scale to pilot scale uh, easier by allowing our developers to have a more informed picture of what's going on in the off-gas system. So by coupling um, our laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy elemental sensors with the molecular sensors that they're making at PNNL, we'll be able to paint a really good picture of what's not only happening from stage to stage in your off-gas system, but as Amanda showed, you can even look at what's going on in your treatment step, like the hydroxide scrubber, seeing what's happening in your salt and the gas phase above it. So together through sensor fusion, we'll be able to really optimize this system. Laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy is a form of optical spectroscopy, so it has a lot of the same benefits that Amanda mentioned. However, it is a little bit different than Raman or UV Viz. It's a little bit less mature, and that just means that there's a little bit more challenge when it comes to uh, putting this in line on a system. But the way that Liz works is you pulse a high energy laser onto a focal point of a sample or a gas space. There, the energy density is so great that it actually ablates the material and forms a microplasma. As that plasma returns back to its ground state, it, em it emits light that you can capture through fiber optics and route to a spectrometer. And there you can get a characteristic spectrum of your sample that's essentially an elemental fingerprint of everything that's in that sample. There's little to no sample prep. You can typically just do this right directly on the sample. Most of the challenges come with how do I get this measurement tool to the sample. You can use LIVs for solid liquid and gas analysis and even mixtures of that, which makes it a really robust technique. You can have high sensitivities. So typically for LIVs, you're looking at PPM range, but actually uh, you can drive this down much further than this. Uh, LIVs is actually considered quasi non-destructive because when you're looking at solid samples, there are a couple nanograms that are ablated, just like all the other optical techniques. You can actually have this be fiber optic based, which makes it ideal for radioactive environments such as a hot cell like this shown here, where you can route uh, everything through a fiber optic and only have that fiber and a simple probe head be exposed to your field. Most of the challenges with um, how to get the measurement taken. And then the other challenges that we needed to uh, kind of overcome were if we want to develop a sensor for an off-gas system, we need to have a surrogate off-gas system to test it on. So we needed to figure out the best way to produce this surrogate aerosol. Um, to do that, we decided to go ahead and use a collagen nebulizer shown here. The way this works is you force gas through a tiny pinhole, creates a siphon which will draw liquid up from your reservoir through this channel where the gas pushing through the pinhole will actually jet the liquid out into the headspace of your nebulizer. Here, larger droplets will impact the edge and fall back to your liquid reservoir, which allows for a rapid recirculation in your nebulizer so your sample is always well mixed. And the smaller particles will remain, remain in suspension and they'll go off to your testing system. So here on the right is a uh, glass collagen nebulizer. You can see the larger droplets um, on the outside of the container and then the elbow at the top where it will go out. Here we have it in line with a cascade impactor so that we could get aerosol particle size distributions. From those particle size distributions, we were actually able to look at how our particle sizes change as the nebulizer pressure changes. You can see here uh, for the most part, everything's always between 1 to 10 microns. And that's actually a very pleasant result because in some of the uh, re early reports on the molten salt breeder reactor, they were talking about expecting aerosol sizes ranging between 1 and 10 micrometers. And as I'll show you in a little bit, we're able to get some really good results measuring these aerosol streams. So our unit is applicable to those systems. Other main takeaways are that our species peak areas and uh, Plasma electron densities are pretty independent of the pressure in our nebulizer. So that's, again, just showing um, how robust the LIB sensor is. 
how do we measure an off-gas system uh, stream with a laser? So, you know, you need to have line of sight for your laser to be focused in onto the sample and ablate. You also need line of sight to collect your light. Unfortunately, in an off-gas system where there might be aerosol products, you don't want those aerosol particles to plate out on your optical windows. So this is the solution we came up with where we have our aerosol or surrogate off-gas stream coming in through this inner pipe. And then we flow a sheath gas through a concentric outer pipe. And then we break the two pipes. The sheath gas will actually maintain the flow path of the aerosol through this gap so that none of it will actually plate out on these windows. We're able to still have line of sight for our measurements. Another nice thing about this, and the optical windows are all commercially available. So they're easily replaced if anything ever does go wrong. And also there are several other available ports on the system so that we could easily uh, couple in line other measurement techniques. A little video of us turning the sheath gas on and off just so, how you, can, so you can see how effective it really is. Um, you'll notice that once we turn on the sheath gas, some of the aerosol uh, particles that are out here actually get sucked back in. So it's a very powerful uh, system maintaining that flow path across the gap. And then here is our system with the in-house made collagen nebulizer and our prototype measurement cell. Uh, the first thing we did was test this all with an aqueous aerosol system. And we wanted to kind of show that our sensor works and mainly looking at lanthanides here as uh, surrogate fission products that you might see in an off-gas system. Here we ranged the concentrations from zero to 2,000 parts per million in that liquid reservoir. And because we did those cascade impactor measurements, we were actually able to calculate the dilution factor between the liquid reservoir and our nebulizer and the aerosol stream at our measurement point. And so it's looking like 2,000 parts per million in our reservoir actually corresponds to around five parts per billion at the measurement point. So we're actually measuring very low uh, concentrations. Here you can see a typical lib spectrum. So uh, you'll notice it's dominated by argon, which is that sheath gas and the gas used to produce the aerosol. Uh, your hydrogen from the aqueous aerosol species. And then down here, there's some very small peaks that correspond to our analytes. So here are some close-ups. So you can just see the difference in scale, uh, 0 0.006 versus 1 here. So because those species responses are so small, univariate models aren't very effective but you can rely on uh, cumulometric modeling as a really powerful tool to pull out the signal from your spectra. So the way uh, PLS, partially squares regression works, is you have a matrix X, which is your spectra, and a Y, which is your corresponding concentration matrix. You break these down into latent structures through an iterative process, finding these vectors in the latent space that best relate your spectral response to your concentration, and then through that, it's able to build high fidelity calibration model. These are validation samples after we've built our uh, PLS models and we're able to match everything really well on a parity plot. So we're very happy with that. And again, uh, this 2000 is in the liquid reservoir. So it's actually much less at the measurement point. Building a calibration model on a system is one thing, but what we really wanted to show is how our sensor could be used and to do that, we wanted to do a real-time test. So to do that, we have our measurement system in our laser enclosure, and we're actually able to pump stock solutions back and forth to change the concentration in our liquid reservoir in real time. The dashed lines are based off ICP grab samples, and the solid lines are our model predictions. Off the bat, things don't look as good as we would expect. So uh, even though the parity plot matched up really well, here you can see, especially with gadolinium, that there is a big discrepancy in this large region. And so we kind of had to step back and ask, even though our validation samples say that our calibration model looks good, is there any other way that we can enhance the predictive capabilities? So what we came up with was using machine learning in the form of a genetic algorithm. So here, a genetic algorithm is essentially based off of the process of evolution, form a population of arrays containing zeros and ones, and what that means to us is a zero is a nan nanometer of wavelength that is not included into the model. And a one corresponds to uh, one nanometer of wavelength being included in the model. Multiply this array of one and zeros by your spectra. And then you build a PLS model and see how well it does at prediction. From that, 
you do what's called crossover, which is essentially mismatching parts of this array and mutation. And it's an iterative process until you reach some sort of convergence or an end of your iteration that you're going to allow. And the goal at the end is you essentially have this wavelength filter that only allows the features of your spectra that are the most important for prediction through. Here's a good example that really shows how it looks. So the blue uh, spectra is before we do any sort of filtering. And then the orange is after we've done the genetic algorithm. So you can see it only lets certain features in. You can see noticeable features that it drops this peak here, here, uh, these peaks right here. And it only uses these. Using this genetic algorithm filter, we were actually able to reduce the number of our latent variables in our PLS model uh, significantly. And this is great because typically you want your number of latent variables in your PLS model to be equal to the number of analytes or independent variables in your system. So having it on the scale of four to three is really great. Here is that online monitoring data rerun. And so you can see the gadolinium really corrects itself really well. Um, there's still a little bit of discrepancies between these high samarium and edemium areas. But again, these discrepancies are a lot better in that way. So now that we've shown our system being used on aerosol species, you know, another thing that lives is going to be really good for, and the main thing you're probably going to see in your off-gas system are these noble gases that are produced during fission, so xenon and krypton. So we wanted to go ahead and run a system with that. So here we vary uh, xenon and krypton from 0 to 10 grams per hour flow rates. And then we also included some other aerosol species of cesium and rubidium as their corresponding daughter species. Here's our new system. So again, inside our laser enclosure is essentially the same thing, but now we have uh, this mass flow controller letting our xenon and krypton in and we're bubbling it through our collision nebulizer. And that's how we're introducing it into our aerosol stream. Here's what that spectrum will look like. So you can see uh, these krypton and xenon peaks are very large and the rubidium peak down here, very small in comparison. Here's some close-up peaks to really illustrate that a little better. So you'll see xenon and krypton have very well-defined peaks. Um, the cesium and rubidium peaks are very small, and that's just because their concentration is so much lower. But because xenon had such a good response, we're actually able to build univariate models in addition to PLS. So you can see there's a nice linear response to changing concentration for those species. And then we were able to uh, run validation and samples again and test how well those models that we've built are able to predict. So here you see for the noble gases, everything predicts really well. Univariate and PLS models both predict the noble gases really well on this parity plot. Cesium and rubidium, uh, they follow the trend. You can see there's some discrepancy with cesium. Cesium is a notably difficult species for LIBS to analyze because of its lack of spectral peaks. There's only a couple peaks in the near infrared region. But uh, again, in the light that 2000 ppm is actually a lot greater than what it truly is at the measurement point, um, these are, we're pretty happy with these results. Again, we wanted to do a real-time test. And because we had these mass flow control controllers, we got to do something that we couldn't do before, which was have a lot finer uh, changes and the gas that we're allowing in. So here, uh, we only did it with Krypton because Xenon, uh, the prices are a little prohibitive, but uh, we varied Krypton in these different waveforms and watched our models pick it up and read it in real time. And so you can see uh, these two sine waves, whether it be a higher frequency or lower, uh, it picks it up really well. And then even uh, step stepping the mass flow up and down um, in these rapid steps, the model was still able to uh, pick it up pretty well. And so this will be useful information uh, when we're trying to make that jump from pilot to bench scale because we can actually do frequency response testing on off-gas treatment components by sending a sine wave into our component and then measuring what comes out on the other side and based off frequency shifts and phase changes as well as amplitude changes, you can actually infer a lot of information about your off-gas treatment component. You know, we've developed this sheath gas measurement system, which will allow us to look at aerosol gas streams in real time. Uh, we've shown that LIBS is capable of looking at multiple elements in real time. It can ex be expanded further and further and further. Nearly in the entire uh, periodic table can be looked at with LIBS, and that's really the selling point for the technology. Uh, we've also shown how genetic algorithms, as well as other types of machine learning, can really be implemented to 
uh, increase our predictive capabilities. Where is the project going next? So we're working on, uh, we've almost got this complete, having a molten salt off-gas surrogate system, where here we have our uh, collagen nebulizer where we're making a molten salt aerosol and we'll be measuring it down here. We're also planning this year to integrate our lib sensors with some metal organic framework filters that's being uh, manufactured at PNNNL. Ultimately, the goal is to get uh, our lib sensor as well as the PNNNL sensors into some of the molten salt loops here at Oak Ridge and really start to get some uh, real-time data and have a sort of test bed for off-gas treatment components. That's the goal. I'd like to thank everybody on the MSR campaign team. If you do have any questions that I don't have a chance to answer because we are kind of tight on time, feel free to email me.